I think there were two, two things on my mind when I wrote the book. When I left Albany in 2018, after about five years, <clears throat> the first three, three and a half years was, put, was to put the consolidation in place, the mechanics of it. And when I left, I had time to reflect, and I had the same sensation in retirement that I had when I lived in East Asia for four years. I lived in Bangkok, Thailand for two years working as a civilian for the federal government and another two years in, in Taiwan in the military. That is, I could think about this nation better and much clearer when I was out of it. And I mentioned to the group this morning, I had the same feeling that James Baldwin had when he went to Paris in 1948. He reflected and talked about America out of it. <clears throat> then he went to Istanbul and 13 years later and finished another country in the fire next time. In his later years, he had a place in southern France with people like Sidney Poitier, Harry Belafonte, and Ray Charles <clears throat> would visit him. So it was, a time, it was a period of reflection. So those four years in East Asia and my retirement time gave me time to reflect about Albany, Georgia, and what I had experienced. And I was not physically and emotionally exhausted, but I was exhausted with the thought that this nation has not reconciled its past. <clears throat> the reason I say that with a great deal of certainty is what white citizens in Albany said to me in this consolidation, what African Americans said to me, they gave me unvarnished comments and just unloaded on what they felt about this relationship that they had no interest in. And they wondered why the regions could do this to them. They had no interest in being educated together. They had interest in being educated separately. So I decided <clears throat> that I would write about that. And so the book was, when I started to put all this together, one of the editors at the University of Georgia Press suggested to me, you need to talk about how you arrived at some of the things you have said to us, those values that you brought to it. Where did they come from? And I mentioned things like exceptionality. I was parented with two people who gave me a sense of exceptionality. Oh, performance and achievement, deferred gratification, uh, investment saving. Uh, all of those things that Many of you feel are very normal, but they, they were very intense about those things. My mother was explicit and my dad was implicit through his behavior. So these people at the UGA Press say, you have a leadership style that <clears throat> impacted this consolidation. Talk about that. Talk about coming of age in Jim Crow, that, that you spent 18 years under a legal system called segregation and how that impacted the lens through which you look at the world. So that's the first part of the book is about that. So I wrote the book to get a sense of the intersections, how all of my becoming out of the country for four years, growing up in one of the poorest sections of the state of Alabama. Art, Art, with our guest from Argentina, this might be a good time to talk about what, you, what was Jim Crow? How did it affect your life growing up? And uh, uh, give, them, give the, our Argentinian guests a sense of that. Okay, and I used to, to raise this with uh, some Albany State students. <clears throat> Jim Crow was a, a character in the 1830s created by an itinerant white actor named Thomas Rice. And he played a illiterate buffoon, African-American man, who danced and he would sing. And he blackened his face. He got dyed to make it, made his face black. And he called the character Jim Crow and would have a song that says, Dance Jim Crow. But it was to, sh to show the illiterate buffoon, shiftless African-American, a caricature. So he would go about the country entertaining white audiences with this character. And somehow in the 1880s, the 
system of laws uh, became, that label became attached to those laws. And those laws lasted about 100 years. To give you an example, restrooms, restaurants, hotels, buses, everything was separate. To bring it closer to home, my mother, like most of the women in a farming community, were excellent seamstress. They could make their they could make dresses and make their clothes. But once a year, she would take a shopping trip to Selma. My dad and I would go, and for the two of us, she would go and stay all day. It was excruciating for us, but we had to go and wait for her. Um, there was no place in Selma to wait. There was one place that he and I used to wait. He always had a newspaper in his hand, always had a book. And we would go to the colored waiting room of the ground bus station to sit and wait for her. And you walk around, right coming through Selma, the bus station was on the way coming toward Highway 80, getting coming to Marion. But you would walk up to the bus station. On the left was a white waiting room. On the right was the color. So he'd never go in and sit down. And he would read, and I would get a Coke and sit. So we'd wait three or four hours for her to finish her shopping. Or we waited in the car, but there was nowhere to sit because of, of, of the segregation. And in many ways, she, she would uh, not take very long on some of those trips because African Americans were not allowed to try on clothes. They, you could hold them up to you and people could measure you, but you couldn't try them on. And that was one of the racial caste systems that you couldn't swim in all white swimming pools, but this whole caste system of purity versus pollution. <clears throat> and that's what you have separate water fountains, separate, you couldn't swim in uh, swimming pools and use restrooms. So that was the racial caste system called Jim Crow. And it lasted about 100 years. <clears throat> and the reason a man named Martin Luther King, uh, how he helped change the system, is he said, let's be measured by the content of our character. He made a speech in 1963 in August, probably one of the best speeches of the 20th century. But he said, we as a nation need to end this system. And he was arrested 29 times for his meddling and went to jail many times and was killed at age 39. And he led the, seven, he led the Montgomery boycott when he was 26 years of age. We now celebrate uh, his birthday. And we're likely to celebrate it as long as this country exists because it's a national holiday. So the Jim Crow system was a system of laws. Now what's interesting about it, it wasn't just laws, it was policies, practices, and customs. And so the question you might ask, well, how do you enforce it? Well, you enforce it by violence and intimidation and terrorism. In the 1920s, 1925, 1926, the Klan was at March down Pennsylvania Avenue, one of the largest marches that they ever had. And they had people in high places who supported them. They came out of the woodwork. So throughout the rural South, so it was violence and intimidation. Now what the juxtaposition was for me, I grew up in a warm and very deeply caring community. As a child, I never felt unsafe. And, I'm, and I was talking to someone recently, the sharecropping system, unless you really violate it, one of the highest civil the Jim Crow laws, you were not jailed for petty crimes because they needed you to work on the farm. And so they, they had petty laws at the bottom and, and the serious laws at the top. The most serious law was the relationship between the sexes, men and women of different races. You could get yourself killed in a minute in these rural areas if you violated that one. Emmett Till got killed for allegedly making a, a, a whistle. And I had two high school classmates who had to leave in the middle of the night in the 1960s. One was a veteran. Another, they got him out, my mom and dad got him out overnight because of an allegation that they had been too familiar 
with the opposite sex and the opposite race. So things could go along very placid until that one popped up. And that, you could get, you could lose your life in a minute. So that was what the Jim Crow system was. And King said, time out, enough of this. And he gave his life for that um, at age 39. So I try to talk about this in a way where there's not rage, anger, and resentment, because, because I don't think we can manage this multi-nation, I mean multi-racial nation, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious, unless we use three words, generosity, compassion, and restraint. And we won't use rage, resentment, and anger. What we saw in January, on January 6th, that's not the solution. Because if you look at our nation, this is a demographically diverse nation. It's becoming even more so. The change, what causes people across the world historically to get really upset and be open to demagogues is when there's uncertainty around social and economic issues primarily. And we have one of them right now. That is this demographic shift that's going on. And so the supremacy of one group over another won't sustain itself. Now, I'm worried about our democracy, uh, and I've never lacked optimism, even in the dying days of Jim Crow, I was optimistic, because I knew, because I, I left the United States to go to East Asia when those Jim Crow laws were in place. And the first time in my life I experienced freedom and liberty was in a foreign country. I could walk around the island of Taiwan and Taipei and Tainan no colored and white signs. I could go into bookstores, I could go into hotels, I could go into bars, restaurants, tailor shops, freely when I couldn't do it in Selma, Alabama. I couldn't do it in Demopolis, Alabama. <clears throat> so when I came back home, having experienced those two years, I knew I was not going to live the rest of my life under this system. I didn't know how it was going to play out, didn't know how it was going to work. But for me, internally, Jim Crow was over, but it was still in place. So I had, I had optimism about that. Now, when I see some of our fellow citizens who feel so threatened by this sea change demographically that's happening until they're willing to do things that I never thought I'd hear people say, especially at the highest levels of government, and one of the things that I mentioned to the group this morning, <clears throat> when I was on my way to East Asia, my dad dropped me off at a place, a little town called Thomasville, Alabama, railroad town. That's where my mother's from. And Wallace was on the back of a flatbed truck. And he was one of the most gifted demagogues. That is, could rile people up and get them all agitated. The ones that I remember, my time. Huey Long was before my time, but Ross Barnett in Mississippi, uh, George Wallace in Alabama, Talmadge, Eugene Talmadge in Georgia, Strom Thurmond in South Carolina. But Wallace was up on the back of this flatbed truck after the country and western band had warmed up the crowd. And he, and he could uh, really go on a rant. And he started out by talking about states' rights and our state and federal and state separation and our way of life that we hold dear. He said, I want all, and these are all working class whites in that community. And he said to them, I want to tell you something. And you need to let, you need to vote for me because here's what I'm going to do for you. First of all, let me outline what the problem is. He said, that, that Frank Johnson went to law school with me, that lying scalawag of a federal judge named Frank Johnson, he's your enemy. The other folks out there who think they're better than you are, and he was on a roll then. He said, they're hippies, they're communists, they're Jews, and they're Yankees, and those liberal college professors up at these schools in, around the state of Alabama. They think they're smarter than you are, and they think they're better than you are. 
I like rednecks. And at that moment, people started to yell, give them hell, George, give them hell. And so he had this crowd threatened beyond the, they, and they, he used socialism and communism. That equality, I won't use the word that he used, but equality for, for black folks. We have it figured out in Alabama. We know our place and they know their place. And so he went on and on. And by that time, the, the bus drove up. That was my bon voyage to East Asia. That was my goodbye to my nation, hearing him make that talk. So when I hear people now who are asking us to be our worst selves, leaders who are asking us to be our worst selves, is not look at compassion, generosity, and restraint, but feeling completely threatened by and willing to look at what Jefferson Adams and Madison created, which is a magnificent document, but it didn't include slaves. And what Martin Luther King was saying in civil, in the, that hundred years after Jim Crow, it should include us. There's nothing wrong with what Mr. Jefferson said, Mr. Adams said, and Mr. Madison said, but it cannot exclude American citizens. We cannot have a separate class of people over here. So that was sort of the the feeling and seeing and thinking about this that I've had time, Steve, to, to look at those intersections and how that got played out in my time in Albany, Georgia. That's why I chose the title Unreconciled. And the reason that I settled on that title, I looked at what the South Africans did. Mandela said, we cannot have 30 million people black South Africans angry, and five or six or seven million Africanas who have run this system of subjugation. We gotta let some, we gotta let some steam out of this kettle. We're gonna have something called truth and reconciliation, which means we're gonna trail, tell the truth and reconcile. And one of the things I guess that troubles me the most is are we living in a post-truth society? Are we living in a time now where people don't tell the truth anymore in our, our leadership, post-truth society? We have mythology and we have facts. And we only want to talk about the mythology and not the facts. And so we can't get that out. We, we can't get that out. So I've been struggling with this in my own mind. And, and I've, my sense of optimism has sort of tapered off because I'm seeing too many significant people. As I used to say in Southwest Alabama, I thought they had more sense than that. I thought they had more sense than that. They're willing to look at something that's so egregious and so wrong. And they're saying nothing about it. Nothing about it. And All right, let's shift now to uh, how did, <clears throat> I want to shift, step back and step forward. I'd like you to talk a little bit about your experience as a student uh, at the university. Then I'm going to shift again back to how did this all play when you arrived at uh, Allen. So first, if you could talk about what life was like here at UA when you got back from uh, East Haven. I was, some of you may know this, but Reese Pfeiffer used to be the student union building. Uh, where Ferguson is now, the student union building was a football field. And so I was, got out of the military on uh, Friday, 22 years of age, went to see my mom and dad. And on Sunday I was in Patey Hall and had just been out of the military a couple of days and walked over to <clears throat> the student, the soup store to get my textbooks and was walking back and someone in Morgan Hall, which is right across from here, yelled out a racial slur and said, go home. And what, and I was amused and kept on walking because when I said to the group this morning, I'd been out of the country and I had not heard that word. I heard it before I left Alabama. And when he yelled at me, I said, I am back at home. <laughs> this, this, this truly tells me, I, what I, when I heard that, that tells me I'm back in Alabama. 
So I went on and had gone beyond feeling too much intensity about the issues of race because I had been treated in a way with freedom and liberty. So I was relaxed much more than some of my colleagues. <clears throat> and the first class I went in, about 30 people and 10 who were on the ground floor, but about 30 students, about 10 got up and walked out. They never came back. And I was a junior, I remember very clearly, my third year, if I sat in this seat, this seat, this seat, and that seat was always empty. No one ever sat by me in a class until my junior year. And it was mostly after Wallace stood in the door in 63, I was here in 66. It was almost how religious sex shun when you, when you do things that they disapprove of. In our case, you were, you were in our space. Wallace was trying to say, this space is not set aside for you. It's set aside for white people in the state of Alabama. And so what students who would get off the sidewalk <clears throat> was suggesting that you're in the wrong place and, we need, and you're offending us, so we need to get back away from you. And, and around 69, uh, all of that had started to change dramatically as the numbers rose. But in 1967, I, along with four of the African-American students, walked on the Alabama football team. Kenny Stabler was the quarterback, played for the Oakland Raiders. Jackie Sherrill, who coached at four places, Mississippi State, Washington State, Texas A&M, and Pittsburgh. He was a graduate assistant. They only had the three major networks, CBS, ABC, and NBC, no cable. And so they interviewed us. I had no interest in staying on the football field. I had done my time in the military, but I did have interest in creating the normaliz normalization of space for people of color. That no place should be set aside because of your race. And that happened, and it was to, and I had a sense of that at the time. It was to change uh, a sense of place racially in every aspect of life in this, on this campus here. And that's what we were attempting to do. <clears throat> now, when I got to Albany, what surprised me is, and Steve mentioned this, Martin Luther King and the people in Albany said this to me, Dr. Dunning, I don't know where you think you are, but this is a hard place down here. So Dr. King came down here and he couldn't crack this nut. He did some things in Selma and Birmingham, but we were, we couldn't get anything done. And <clears throat> Albany sits right in the middle of the, this region that starts in Southern Virginia, shaped like a crescent goes over to East, Ta uh, East Texas. At, Georgia has 159 counties. We have 67 in, in the state of Alabama. Nine of the poorest counties in that crescent area are in South Georgia, run right through South of Macon, right through Albany. So it's the plantation agriculture. And so it has all the elements of superior subordinate racial stratification. You still have those elements and you still have the culture and values and beliefs, but they're not as sort of in your face. And people would talk to me about that. And I mentioned to the group this morning when the consolidation was announced, a guy I knew very well, a white attorney, invited me to come to his law firm. He said, Dr. Dunning, I'm on Darden's foundation. Excuse me. And I'm getting beat up by some of my friends about this consolidation. The chancellor won't change his mind. He's going to make this happen. Could you come talk to us? Because we need to know what, what's going on. And I said, absolutely. I said, now you do not speak with candor about, and there are no, there are no side conversations. I said, my conversation with you would be the same I'll have with anybody. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So I went in, and they had set aside the entire morning about 10 people, all men except there was a woman there. But they were all part of the uh, decision-making leadership in Albany. And when I started to talk through the process, and I mentioned that 
the Chancellor had decided to keep the HBCU mission and Darden Access mission, that we integrate those as part of this consolidated institution. One guy raises and he said, Dr. Bennett, I don't mean any harm, but what in the hell is an HBCU? Just tell me what the hell that is. So I was, I maintain, I was kind of stoic. I said, well, let me, let me kind of walk you through when that was identified, 1965 Higher Education Act. And Title III money flows to about 104 or five HBCUs and to strengthen the foundational infrastructure administratively. Well, you do know the white students in Albany would never go to a place named Albany State. You do understand that, don't you? They'll go up the road to Georgia Southwest or go to Valdosta State or go to Georgia Southern, but they're not going to Albany State. They'll leave town before they do that. And I said, uh, if you want to know my real bias, this should have been done 25 years ago. We left you to your devices down here. This, this consolidation, what do you mean? I said, I was in the system office 13 of those years. And what we noticed from this community is the infighting between two sister, sister campuses. We left you to your devices. While the issue is, is serving the academic needs of students, not creating safe racial space, but to serve the academic needs of students. Well, Dr. Dunner, you don't understand. We're not Atlanta. We're not Atlanta. We, so I said, well, I can't think of a single decision that they made in those 13 years I spent in the system office. They changed because somebody got mad. I can't think of one that the Board of Regents changed. So we, are, we have a challenge. That was on that side. <clears throat> then I get back on campus and talk to our, some of the senior leadership team and some of the alums of Albany State. They said, Dr. Dunnett, they're trying to steal our campus. They're trying to steal our university. And I said, I hate to tell you this, I don't think that's the case. I think they want no part of it. They just would like for you to do what you wish to do, do what we wish to do, but don't bring us in the process. Let's keep darting. So I had two unwilling partners. And what was so interesting to me is that both groups felt completely at ease telling me everything that was on their mind. They were just to put on load the deepest, most concerns they had about this consolidation. And there were some amusing moments. I mentioned to the group this morning that in the street discussion of a man who, and he was pretty earthy and pretty profane. I didn't get into all the details of what he said, but he walked behind, followed me out of the barbershop, African-American man. He said, Dr. Dunning, uh, those folks downtown, he meant the white leadership. They tried to get Albany State closed in the flood of 94. And they had some help, but they couldn't get it closed because they had a governor and a uh, chancellor who just wouldn't agree with that. So you need to be careful. You need to watch those people downtown. Now those folks at Albany State with this consolidation, you're gonna have your hands full with them because they don't want to change anything. They like what they have, they think they're right. They don't, and I don't know, some of their systems are messed up given what I hear. This is a guy standing outside of a barbershop. And his last parting words, he said, I don't envy your job because you're gonna catch hell from both of them. And luckily, before I took the job, I was here in Tuscaloosa having a good time. I had retired, so I didn't need the job. And I think had I needed the job, I wouldn't have changed anything that I did. So I was free to speak about serving students and the integration of two unlike institutions that viewed themselves as equals. They were not equal. One was a two-year college with one or two bachelor's program, another had EDS master's program. But because it was a black and white discussion, they had made themselves equal. They were not equal. <clears throat> so that's how, Steve, that got played out. 
And one of the things why I think the UGA, UGA editors asked me to write on the, uh, about the coming of age in the black belt and the time abroad, because they had talked to me about some of those things. And that has shaped a lot of my approaches to leadership. And throughout my entire life, lived abroad for four years and spent three years in Mexico City as a visiting professor. But I visited over 30 countries around the world, and usually I spent time with academics. And I'm going to make one more point, and then I'll stop and respond to another question. I spent time <clears throat> with a group of academics in Cameroon in West Africa. Part Cameroon was colonized by the parts of it was French and other part British. It must have been six or eight ag academics. And I raised the question. I said, what, and there were some there from both areas. I said, what was it like to be colonized by the French versus colonized by the British? And they spent, had a spirited discussion about that. And they said, Dr. Dunning, now, what makes you, you, meaning the United States of America, what makes you unique? I said, I think there are two things, the rule of law and orderly transfer of power. Now, if I'm going to ask that question today, I'm not sure what I would say. I'm not sure, because I used to say that with confidence. And in the 90s, I went to Ghana with President Carter to monitor the national elections in Ghana. And we went to polling stations and villages in a place called Takarati in Sekondi to observe the election and to make sure that the election was free and fair. And I thought about that the other day. In my entire life, there's never been a time that we were not talking about voter suppression in this country. Either how many jelly beans are in a jar, how many bubbles are in a bar of soap, read the Constitution and interpret it, poll tax, and today, still doing it. And so I'm trying to figure out what is it that this exercise of your voice, that so many people will fight and create innovative ways to prevent that. But it seems to be what we have going on. And if you ask me what's the solution for it, I don't have an easy one right now except free people in a democracy will have to say, do you not have any shame? And I think as, as Martin Luther King and, and his lieutenants and others, when they started to push back with civil disobedience and nonviolence, they just said, we're not doing this. We just, we're not going to do this. So somehow we've got to come to grips with this. But, but now, I don't know what the solution is. You might know, but I honestly do not know. Steve? I would I want to have a discussion about the, the uh, strategies for racial reconciliation. I think now is a good time to have the audience ask questions. So uh, are there questions? We'll have Mike come around, so if you'd like to ask one, hold up your hand. And if no one jumps in, I'll, I'll ask another. There's one in the back, there's several over here. I'll have one up front. We'll get the next one. Dr. Stanley, thank you so much for coming here tonight. Uh, you sort of spoke to this a little bit earlier in your comments about uh, where we are today as a nation, as you think about whether we're talking about voting, what's happening with voting, uh, how we have been in part parsed to these very extreme positions. What is your thought about where we go from here, if you will? Uh, whether we're speaking about the educational experience of all people in the nation, or really, as I heard the speaker say the other night, a fight for our democracy in light of the, the principles that you spoke about earlier. Where do we go from here? Um, we have something that, that's called social media. <clears throat> it has allowed people from around the globe to communicate and to connect, but it also has allowed mean-spirited people to use it as a, an accelerant 
to create fires and damage. So we no longer have the hiding Carters of the world in Mississippi and around the gills of the Constitution. People who write in newspapers almost force you to think analysis and synthesis because you might have a weekly newspaper, you might have a daily, but you, you would read it, you'd think about it. These devices we have in our pockets, um, people can put anything on it anytime. And if they're not driven by facts and honesty and respect and dignity, this could be one of the most destructive things we've ever happened, ha had happened to us. So technology, technology is playing a major role uh, in, in the lives of people around the world. And how that intersects with freedom of speech. How do you have access to a platform that you can say anything you wish to say, but if you're irresponsible and you're mean-spirited, you can do damage to communities, to nations, and to people. That's the piece then, <clears throat> that striking the balance of freedom of speech and the role of technology in our civic life. I, and we've gotten, we've become so slash and burn and zero sum, I win, you lose. What I'm thinking about would require people of goodwill of different um, backgrounds. And when I mention generosity, respect, and compassion versus rage, resentment, and anger, and how the strategies that people use now to exclude and to win at all costs. But what I think would, would this will require is people who are in different political camps, different racial groups, different backgrounds, is to say there's something bigger than all of us. And that's how we govern ourselves, is how we govern ourselves. And can we create something that rises above parochial and partisan interests. Unless people understand that my winning an election is not as important as our government, then we're going to be in a, in a tough position. And so what we seem to have is that people know those things that cause us anxiety and concerns, and, it's, and they just stoke the fires up. That's what the demagogues like George Wallace and others did. They would figure out, and they would get on the stump and use political theater, but they did not have the uh, social media platforms. The Germans only had the radio, and they got carried away with just that, uh, and did some damage that, uh, that's unbelievable in terms of the scope. And now we have a technology platform that allows us to, to do and say anything at a moment's notice. So that's going to be, for me, that's going to be the challenge of protecting something. And Steve and I have had this discussion. In my under-resourced school, I had some of the, I had master teachers in a poor county. But I had outstanding social studies and civics. I had, I had one guy who was a World War II veteran, went to Tuskegee. He was one of the most gifted teachers I've ever been around. We'd almost run in his classroom to hear what he had to say. And so I was well grounded in our system of government, coming out of a poor system, school system. And so I'm beginning to wonder if people are so free and willing to just cast this aside, what are we teaching? What, what are people learning? Because I don't think, you, I don't think you, comp you've compared and contrasted systems that if you're willing to, the one we have. When I lived in Taiwan, we were <clears throat> under martial law because uh, in 1948, Chairman Mao and Chiang Kai-shek had engaged in, in warfare and the insurgents won. So Mao chased them out of the mainland to Taiwan. They set up 
government in, in Taipei. Uh, so that martial law gave me a sense of comparing and contrasting. I knew Jim Crow, I knew democracy that some people had access to, then I hear the martial law. Then when I went to Bangkok, they had king and a queen, a monarchy. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson had an aversion to that. Um, this hereditary advantage, you were born as royalty. That you have a king and a queen and prince, princess, duchess. He said, no, no, no. We need what he called a natural aristocracy that you judge by your virtue and your talent. It's the people. And what so intrigues me about this is I find that fascinating, but at the time, he owned slaves. He, but yet, what he was conceptually talking about, if you include everybody in the process, it's not a bad way to do business in terms of government. And so, I've had the good fortune of being in countries where they did not have. And we've had to fight here. And I, I talk about this in the book. My, I voted the first time on a military base overseas, but the first time I voted back in the States, Marengo County moved from dry to wet to vote to sell alcohol. So one day I had finished class in Tenhua, and I drove down to Marengo County to vote, to vote in that. And I voted yes, yes, I'll be able to sell beer. Went by to see my mother. She said, what are you doing here? I said, I came to vote. She said, you came all the way down here to vote to move the county from uh, dry to wet. I said, That's, I, yes, I did. She said, I hope you don't tell anybody that. <laughs> <laughs> and she was teasing. I said, well, I tried to put an elegant spin on it. I said, well, I always do my civic duty. <laughs> she said, oh, okay. I, yeah. But what I felt back in the States when I came back home, that it felt right, it felt good to exercise my voice by walking in on any subject. And I think that's a good way to govern. So are we in a place where, in response to your question, and I, and I really don't know the answer to it, that we can maintain what we have. Do we have enough people who understand enough about governance and civics and places around the world and compare and contrast it to say, let's pull out all the stops to maintain what we have rather than just cast it away and start having somebody who says, I'm staying in office and I'm not leaving. And now do something about it. I've got the guns, I've got the infrastructure, I've got the apparatus, I'm not leaving. Is that what we want? And you guys want to do something about it? In some countries, you just, you're no longer around. You don't hear, they don't mention your name anymore. So, I don't, you know, some of you may think this is a, a passing fancy, but I think I'm seeing a little bit more in, than I think I thought I'd ever see. And I hope I'm wrong. So I'll stop and Steve replies to another question. Oh, I guess I'm going to say, but uh, my name is Amy. I'm a political science student here at the university. Just have a, a quick question. So, considering the state of black startups today, what do you think the uh, greatest value is that we should be focusing on that can compel the school to say that again? I, I missed the latter part. What do you think the greatest battle is that blacks have today that we could focus on that to compel the sports in today's time? For African Americans? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I think from, from my generation, it was to do the kinds of things that Dr. King talked about. It was those structural and legal barriers 
that were in place that seemed at times insurmountable. Until, and I felt that way until I went in the military and saw how close you could get to an egalitarian environment. Uh, we have moved from the manufacturing brawn society to brains, knowledge worker. Uh, I can't think of anything that you want, that you can do in your life when you leave as a student that you won't have the computers and technology. So you would be a knowledge worker. So how do you develop the skills of analysis, synthesis, and reflection with so much information at your fingertips? And when I used to invite Albany State students to our home, the student leaders, I would talk about that with them, that how much information they had that it was not hierarchical anymore. You had to go through this horizontal and I'd ask them how they're doing in school, and somebody said, well, Dr. Dunn, I made a C in, in uh, history. I made a C in political science. I said, how is that possible? You gotta work at making a C, don't you? That's not possible. All the information you have and the repetition and reviewing things you can do with this technology, what are you doing making a C? Well, Doctor, you know how it is. You know, I, I got other things. And I said, no, I don't know how it is. So I was, you know, I, was, I understand the push and tug of students. I was kind of affecting some, uh, how disappointed I was about that. But the point I was making, you do not have to go through anybody to get information. And you do not, and they cannot segregate you on your own computer. They can't prevent you from looking at this. Like the library, the library was the source of information in London, Alabama. They could keep me out of there. And I was telling the group this morning, my access to the world was through something called the U.S. Postal Service. We had, my dad had several things come into the house. Life Magazine, Look Magazine, Birmingham News, and Ebony and Jet. So we got the black press and we got the larger press. The house was full of things. So, the, the postman just bring them to your house and deliver your mail. So we got all, all our information, then we got encyclopedia books th through the mail. But if we go 19 miles to London, it's a white song they sound like. Couldn't go in the library. So we got stuff. And now in your hands, you have the Library of Congress in your hands. Get anything you want to. <clears throat> so you're going to be, if I had to say, what is the new 21st century push for equity and fairness and justice is knowledge, scholarship, learning at the highest level. And one of the things, by virtue of some positions I've had, I never was on an agenda or had to speak about something in the president's cabinet at the University of Georgia or in the system office that I did not prepare where I felt like I was going to be the most knowledgeable person in the room because I had access to information. And there was not going to be a single question you could ask me about what I'm proposing as we go around the table in the president's cabinet that you'd ask me, I couldn't answer. And so <clears throat> what I was attempting to do is making sure that what I'm charged with doing is providing leadership for these functions is to be the knowledge worker at the highest end. So that's why I think that's where I would land. Did you have a question? <coughs> Dr. Dunning, uh, what would your thought process and who encouraged you when you were coming out of the military? Who encouraged you to go and seek further school and further education? And what would you say to a young man such as yourself today uh, and encouraging them to pursue higher education. Yeah. <clears throat> when I was coming out of high school, the goal of almost every young, peop young person I knew, friends of mine, was to leave the Alabama Black Belt. My high school class was part of that great, mi the second phase of the Great Migration. We went to four places. 
to the military, went north, or to Alabama A and M, Alabama State of Tuskegee. In many ways, in almost all cases, taught in the public schools. My dad. That's, that's only one time he and I had not a serious disagreement. But he said, don't go into the military, go to Tuskegee first, and go to ROTC, then you go in. I said, no, I gotta go. <laughs> I said, I'm leaving. And I think he thought when I went in, I would not uh, go to college. But I don't think he knew at the time, but, but the teachers I had in that under-resourced school, and my mom and dad, they had created, they had created intellectual curiosity that was all consuming for me. I was very interested and a good student. So that was a piece of it. <clears throat> the other is I was getting out of the military and the University of Alabama had a center in Montgomery on Bell Street. And I was looking at Penn State, Ohio State, and Michigan State. And the guy who's the director of that center a man named Robert Springfield said, why would you do that? You got the GI Bill that's just been passed by Congress. If you go to these schools, you got to pay something called out of state. I said, what is that? So he said, told me the money. He said, if you transfer, you've already been admitted to the University of Alabama, just transfer up to Tuscaloosa. Never occurred to me. So I said, let me go home and talk to my parents first because many Families had been sanctioned when children did things. If they marched in a civil rights march, because I had some friends who fought parents on a uh, gas station. The supplier the child got out that the child marched at a, in Montgomery in a civil rights march. The suppliers stopped serving their gas station, put them out of business. And so I told my dad, I said, you're a high school principal in Linden, Alabama. If the word gets out, I'm going to the University of Alabama, what do you think about that? He said, well, I've got enough time to retire. You go ahead and do what you think you need to do. And so I came here. And the encouragement from Springfield and, and family uh, sort of guided me to this place. And growing up in Southwest Alabama, the two schools I never even thought about was Auburn and Alabama. The schools that I used to read about in the Pittsburgh Courier, Jackson State, Prairie View to Texas Southern, Southern University in Baton Rouge, Tennessee State. The reason for that, they were sending football players to the NFL. So I kept up with that. But that was my sort of worldview of public higher education, of higher education in general. But not this school, not, not here. And so, this was a financial decision. When I came here on the GI Bill, I got a work-study job in, in uh, Tin Hoor and Dean Gilstrap. I had a job in this building stacking books over the Christmas holiday up in the stacks here. So I was a wealthy man. I, so I had GI Bill, work-study, and the job here. And what helped me was to have people that I respected to help guide me to think about the entire context. And it's going to help pave the way. And I met with some students this afternoon in Ferguson Center, part of the Black Student Union. I think they're admitted students at this campus now who are 13 or 14 years old. <laughs> I looked at those students and I thought, God, you guys look young. And they said, oh, no, Dr. Dunning, I'm older than I look. Uh, but Ferguson was just full of students of color that was, they were not here when I was here. So I felt good that 50 or 60 years ago, 50 years, 50, 55 years ago, I came in 1966, that was a long time ago. There were only 10 African-American students here when I came. And to see that they have dedicated space when we requested space in 1966 to start a group, no one would give us any space. The first meeting we had with a group called the Afro-American Association, 
was in Coma Hall, the way we found that. Buildings used to be left open at night. The safety notion was different. So we walked in and found a classroom that was open and had the first meeting of the black students. So I think the, the idea of getting students educated and fully participating, and students of all backgrounds, uh, is probably part of the solution. And I had a, some key people who gave me some ways to think about that. Steve. I don't see any other questions. Just one and back, Dr. Griffin. Dr. Dunning, uh, if you would please uh, reflect on what you would regard as your greatest achievement in Albany, uh, your greatest disappointment, and, and reflect for a moment uh, on what you learned of each relative to reconciliation. I, I think, Scott, the, the greatest achievement was not let the mechanics of the consolidation be held hostage by any group mm -hmm. around the issue of race, history, and culture. Because th that was, th I think, the greatest achievement. We were able to consolidate those two campuses. <clears throat> got it done on time on the SACS, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools guidelines. So we met every deadline. We did not miss a beat and everything was done well, nothing was ever rejected by the system office or by SACS. <clears throat> so the mechanics of the process. The greatest disappointment is I wished I had known how deep, and I, and I deeply understood the fault lines, but I didn't know how deep they were, that we had been able to create safe space for some hard discussions, that is, bringing community groups together, bringing student groups together. And so we got so engaged in the mechanics of the process, this, this, this side of the process that dealt with race, history, and culture, that is, we don't want to be part of this, is, is creating places on both campuses for people in the community and students and faculty to talk through uh, the angst and concerns and to create an us rather than us and them. We, did, we, we were not patient enough to do that. That was probably the thing that if I had to do over, that's what I would do in a different way. What was the third part, Scott? That was one part. The third part was, uh, then would you reflect on uh, the concept of reconciliation and, and the learning of, uh, or celebration of both of those? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I was thinking about that when I was talking this morning when the, I was walking through a nuclear weapons area in 1963 when probably a week or 10 days after those girls were killed in 16th Street Baptist Church. And there was a lot of uh, strong feelings on that small air station off the coast of China. I was tied up in knots. Not only about the killing of those four girls, but the bombers who put that dynamite there struck at something that deeply goes to the core of the black community in the South, that is the church. One of the first things freed slaves did when they, well, when they got out of bond is start churches. So churches were not just place of worship, but they were social institutions with dignity and respect and conversation and people get together, fellowship. Not just somebody in the pulpit talking. So they put a bomb on something, not just killing the girls, but they killed almost something that's one of the most significant entities. So I was walking through this weapons area. I had a 38 pistol on my side, I had an M2 carbine, the other guy had a carbine. We were walking along talking. He was somewhere, I think Tennessee, I can't remember where. And he was clearly worried about desegregation and getting rid of Jim Crow. He said, well, what do you people want? And I said, you know, I would just take being left alone. 
I would take right now, I would just take, get these laws off my back. I don't want an apology and don't discuss money with me. Preparations, because you can't, I don't think you can pay 350 years. If you had 250 years of slavery, 100 years of segregation, I don't know if you can get a dollar figure on that. But what I think you can do is to leave me alone. And it was, I saw years later the movie Gandhi, the British Viceroy was sitting around the table with other British officials in India and Gandhi was protesting about British presence and colonization. And the guy Viceroy said, Mr. Gandhi, what do you want from us? What do you want us to do? He said, leave, go home. Leave us alone. This is not your country. And they all laughed and said, no, this is, this, is our, you know, this is part of the British Empire. So we may be able to do some other things, but we're not leaving. And so I, I'm trying to figure out, in, in response to your question, there are schools of thought. One is accountability for those 250 years and 100 years of gym. Somebody Somebody needs to own this. Somebody needs to say, I'm sorry about it, or pay me for it. There are others who said, oh, no, I think you will offend my sensibilities to try to me to send you a bill for what, those 350 years. I would take leaving me alone. Others would say, I'll take an apology. So Scott, I have talked to a lot of people about this. I have yet to find any consensus I've yet to find that if we're going to reconcile, is there an apology that will be helpful from every legislative body throughout the 16 southern states that have Jim Crow laws? Does that matter? You know, we've had leading people in the Senate who said, we don't need to pay for anything that none of us had anything to do with. Been 150 years ago, we were not here. None of us, we were not alive. So we have no responsibility for that. End of discussion which leaves what I felt in Albany and many times uh, an unresolved, unreconciled issue. And I've tried to talk about this in the book, but I mentioned this to you in my opening comments. Had I not gone out of this nation at age 18, I don't know what would have happened to me. But I was able to get in a foreign country and spend two years with freedom and liberty and the ability to think about things. So when I got back and had to deal with Selma, Montgomery, Birmingham, Mobile, I was in a different place. And very, yet only 22 years old. So I'd had that sort of out of the, out of the country experience. So what that leaves us with, and I saw this in many meetings at the University of Georgia, the Georgia system, the, the constant undercurrent of race in America the constant undercurrent. And what we have now that is beginning to happen and some of our national leaders are stoking the fires is all out in the open. It is all out in the open. It is right in front of us now. There's no way you can say what the issue is not about. And well, I'll finish this, Steve. We, we are a multiracial, multiethnic, and multireligious nation. And that's not going to change. In fact, it's going to accelerate. So unless we as a people find space for everybody, I don't know how we, I don't know how we, how we make this thing work. Because we, we have to find space. And, and yet, if we don't do that, then we're going to change the nature of how we govern ourselves. And I promise you, that's not a path we need to go down. That's not a path we need to go down. What we need to do, and or do we have enough voices in our communities? So in this book, I try to talk about how a consolidation of two campuses brought out this American dilemma. This, this is the American dilemma, how these two campuses expressed every way of a racial caste system in America, almost every P 
pillar that you can think of that's part of the racial caste system was expressed and in many ways acted out in language and discussion and conversation in the community. So I tried to show that. And I tried to, in, many, in so many ways, is to show my 18 years under Jim Crow did not have enough scarification that it lasted with me. And, and I, I was people who knew me and, and people who know me well know that I push study abroad, that if you go to college, you should not finish college without studying in another country. And I came by that by living four years out of this nation. And it's especially important for young people of color. 